Oh yeah, where am I? Okay, so I'm actually in here. So yeah, this is um, Philosophy of Seer Journal number one, volume one, 2023. Um, new journal, open access, links in chat. And it'll be, uh, if you're watching later, it'll be in the description underneath it or in YouTube. And if you're around at the end and you so choose, we're going to rate this and see if it was any good. I hope it's good because it's a new journal. I hope this stuff doesn't suck. So this is Lost in City, Lessons in Coordination by Alfred Nordman out of uh, Darmstadt, the technical university there. So here we go. Feel free to ask questions along the way. I don't know what's happening. We're going to find out. Introduction. Not all of Ludwig Wittgenstein's similes are compelling. They can be a bit labored, even confusing, and yet prove instructive in surprising ways. Consider the famous passage in which Wittgenstein compares language to the layout of a city. Our language can be seen as an ancient city, a maze of little streets and squares, of old and new houses, with additions from various periods, and, and this surrounded by a multitude of new boroughs with straight regular streets and uniform houses. So this is from uh, Philosophical Investigations, yeah, number uh, 18, I guess. That's interesting. By showing that in the city, the depth of time is flatly spread out in space, Wittgenstein is not so much uh, so speaking about language, but about the philosophy of language. The most recent suburbs are logically built up on the model of scientific language as conceived by Rudolf Carnap. Wow. Okay, so we've got an Ivan, uh, Ivan Neal fan here and others. Terms are operationally defined and fit a conceptual grid. The old town, in contrast, resembles a Heideggerian medieval maze that has not been tidied up by the logicians of his day, but at best has been subject to patchwork, patchwork renovations. So yeah, we've, <laughs> we're hitting everybody now. <laughs> yeah, the bad, the bad old neighborhood. Exactly, Ivan. Yeah, well, I mean, do you really want to live in like suburban, like uh, cookie cutter hell either? I don't know. That cities do not actually develop along this pattern of medieval and modern is one reason why this is somewhat a somewhat labored comparison. The writing or composition of the city does not simply move outwards from its historical center, but involves constant rewriting and overlaying, extrapolation and revisioning, fusing and joining with centers here and there as village structures become incorporated or reinvented as topographic features and existing infrastructure needs need to be negotiated. If this is nevertheless a most instructive remark, um, there are at least three reasons for this, with the third one offering a surprise twist to the story. Firstly, Wittgenstein invites us to turn the comparison around. We might not compare might not compare not we might compare not language to a city, but cities to languages. An invitation to view them as compositions with a particular a peculiar grammar. Cities then need to be read, interpreted, and understood in terms of their elementary units, threaded together by way of streets, electric grids, sewage systems, and transportation infrastructures. This suggests to be sure this suggestion to be sure has been taken up implicitly and explicitly by urban planners and theorists alike, and it works with a works with a received view of what a language is and how it can afford clarity of understanding. Unreal Brian says the walkable neighborhood with a nice with nice cafes and bookshops echo in Lekoff's hood. Yeah, <laughs> repeat that in English. Yeah, so this it feels like this was a little bit translated from another language, but whatever. It's clear enough. Basically, instead of saying um, languages are like cities, you say cities are like languages. And so basically, you're now trying to see what is the grammar of a city. And they're saying, you know, the infrastructure is sort of the grammar. How do you, you know, put like, a, a, you know, the, you hook up a building to the electrical grid. That's a syntax problem. That's a formal relation between the infrastructure and where people go. So that's what it is. You're talking about the formal structures, which are the infrastructure things, the formal structures, and how they get used, like for a building as a place of where people live or congregate. That's the meaning. Like, what's a building do? That's where people live. And how does it work? Well, you have to hook it up to the city grid, which is part of the formal structure of the city. And so, but like, this is what they're saying, taken up explicitly by urban planners and theories alike. So how do you add new places where people congregate? Well, you have to hook it up to the rest of the city. You're talking about transportation. You're talking about sewage, all that stuff. Okay. Secondly, the remark is instructive in regard to Wittgenstein's own punk line, which grants it a peculiar place of prominence. This punk line comes with his conception of what is a philosophical problem and how it manifests itself, namely that philosophical problems take the form, I don't know my way out. Yeah, no problem, but, uh, Adam. 
uh, fighter just ask if you got questions hey vipers how you doing we build our computers the way we build our cities over time without a plan on top of ruins alan ullman yes i mean to be fair, this is how we do most things. We very rarely have a fully worked out plan that just, you know, goes to plan. I mean, literally every dystopia, like your yeah, dystopic vision is something that was going to be fully laid out and then doesn't work. I mean, who's the monkey in the wrench? Like this is a uh, go watch Die Hard. There's always some little monkey in the wrench that fucks up the perfectly laid plan. This is how everything goes. We don't really lay out like perfect metaphysics and then everything works out that way. Just not realistic. But like, yeah, computers are the same. Everything is the same, really. And that's why we're always in trouble. <laughs> and how you doing, Vipers? I hope you're well. Hope the uh, you had some sort of medical thing. I hope you got past it or whatever it was. I forget. Anyway, lost in the city, needing orientation. This is how Wittgenstein... Wittgenstein's problems of philosophy present themselves. The challenge is not one of solving the problem as in a puzzle or mathematical homework assignment, but of finding one for oneself or showing others the way out of the problem, a way of steering clear from it and to show the fly the way out of the fly bottle. We get lost, sometimes trapped even in the world of our own making, because like our cities, what we make is not therefore made according to plan, even the built world is not a world of our design. Yeah, so in some sense, if you're lost in a city, you need to somehow get orientation to figure out what to do then to get yourself um, back on track. Um, this is actually not a crazy point. Like, if you, you get this feeling when you're a tourist and you're in a place you don't know, you have to find landmarks to reorient yourself. Um, like, I was on the subway a while back and there was a guy that was, like, a little older, looked like he was in reasonably good shape, but like he was a little bit agitated. He was talking to people. The dude was an older guy and he just hadn't taken the subway in forever. And he had a car that he lent to his friend and his friend crashed his car. And so he all of a sudden was now having to take the subway for the first time in 20 years. Like I said, he was an older guy. And it's like one of these things where I had a grandma to see. If she was in her neighborhood, she was fine. If she got into a neighborhood she didn't know, couldn't find the subway, she'd have to go, like, you know, rely on some stranger to get her back to something she knew. This poor dude was just a little bit out of his element. If we could just get him back to his area, he would be fine. Because, like, once he got back, he was like, oh, wait, I know this, like, once he was, like, gotten to his area. So I was getting off a stop or two, like, before him. But, like, literally, it was like, dude, next stop. Just get off the train. You'll know where you are. And he was like, yeah, yeah. And so I was like, if we could just get the that dude home, he would be fine. But, like, if imagine he didn't get home. All of a sudden, you'd need, like, medical services, social services. What's wrong What's wrong with this guy? But if we could just get him home, he'd have friends that would help him out. It's like these little things. Like, if once you're in a city and, like, you realize people are out of their element, sometimes they're fine, just they have to get back to where they know where things are going on. This is a little thing that happened, what was that, last year, I think? And I was like, it's like, you just got to help out some... People just need a hand sometimes, and then they're fine. And that guy was fine. He just, he... Had a series of unfortunate things happen, and, you know, then he got himself stuck on the subway, and he didn't know where he was going. It was like, damn. It's like, just get the guy back to his neighborhood. Okay. Uh, story over. Anyway, talking again about Wittgenstein and cities and language. Thirdly, the remark becomes instructive when one more closely considers how we get lost in a city and when we come to acknowledge that we do not know our way about. And so this is what I'm talking about. How do you actually reorient yourself in a place where you're lost? Clearly, this does not happen in our own neighborhood where we share a language and thus a form of life. Ivan says, let's help David Chalmers get back to his neighborhood. Yeah, so this is, so I'm on the same page with this author right here. Like, this is exactly what I was talking about. That guy was okay as long as we could get him to where he understood things again. Unreal Brian says, I've been stuck on a bus and not know where I have got myself to at a much younger age. Yeah, and isn't it a disorienting thing? You don't know how to get, like, you don't even know how to get off the bus because, like, what would you do when you got off the bus? At least on the bus, you're on the bus. It's like your world becomes, like, um, sort of, like, just localized to that one little spot, and you're like, what the fuck? Okay. It happens when we encounter the city as a strange place with many crisscrossing overlapping forms of life where the city is a multilingual place with Chinatown bordering on Little Italy as it is in New York. 
um, when cleaning crews do not share in the in the lives of the house owners or office buildings, when tourists locate themselves on subway maps where some street names are in Cyrillic letters, only others transliterated into the Roman alphabet, where one cannot ask a person on the street but latches onto church steeples and memorized street corners, golden archers, and other landmarks and other landmarks. If one thus takes Wittgenstein's comparison seriously, it leads us from a philosophy of language to the philosophy of multilingualism. Uh, leads from grasping determinate meanings to the negotiation of a bewildering cacophony of signs. Updated the meta content, sharper instructions and filters, same link, this one I'm ready. Cool. Thank you. Give this a reload in the background. Cool. <coughs> so, so I actually... This is a question. I've, what is it to be lost in a place? Like, I like philosophy of place. This is one of the reasons I'm interested in philosophy of city. I'm interested in philosophy of place. How I got into philosophy of place, I forget. It was a long time ago at this point. But, like, um, this is one of the things. When you're lost in a place, what is going on? Uh, I guess that's for Ivan Neo. Let me know if I should uh, show that on stream there. Vipers. <laughs> okay, we've got quali uh, one quality. All right. See, is it is it stream safe, though? Nah, okay. It's for Ivan's eyes only. So, okay. So, but think about this. When was the last time you were lost and what is it to be lost, especially in a strange place? Or not even lost, but like you are just in unfamiliar lands. Illiterate perspectives. The philosophy of the city can benefit from Wittgenstein's simile when it is concerned with a multilingual assemblage of codes and signs, a layering of forms of life and socio-technical sy systems. I mean, consider... How would you read a subway map? I asked a friend of mine who's a school teacher. There's kids in the city that don't learn to read for they had some stupid policies where they just uh, let kids go up a grade without ever learning how to read. So you have like kids in grades that they should definitely know how to read and they didn't know how to read. And so I asked her, how do they take the subway? She says they don't take the subway because they can't read the subway map. They have to like, no, get on one stop, go two stops. But like, that's all they can do. They can't leave like their little area because they can't get out because they can't read the technical. Uh, they really don't understand how the, the subway map works because they can't read like the sort of the diagrams. And so you have to understand like the diagrammatics or whatever the word is for that of the subway map and be able to read the text, but they can't do that. And so it's like, once you realize you have to be able to put maps and technical symbols from the subway together. Yeah. It's a little, it's a little bit, uh, you realize it's kind of complicated once you understand this, you like Descartes philosophy of place. It's easy as X, Y, Z, but um, uh, Antennas to heaven. Now I'm lost. Uh, Cedric Bixler Zavala, the Mars Volta. Oh, okay, yeah. Is that a song, right? Mars Volta? I don't know things. Hey, MDD, what's up? Of course, being lost isn't just about feeling disoriented. Your understanding of the area must actually map onto the reality of the landscape. Easy to imagine a mentally ill person who thinks they're familiar with their landscape but actually has no clue. Yeah. And this was what I was talking about the story earlier. Older guy got a was a little bit disoriented, was on the subway a little bit too long, and was just out of place and out of sorts. And like, just get him out of the subway into an area he knows, and he'd be fine again. And you wouldn't need to call the cops. You wouldn't need to call social services. He'd probably they'd probably have to call a fucking ambulance to check the guy out. But like it, that, like this whole thing would have disoriented him, and it would like more than disoriented exactly. It it would have like unsettled it, like his whole like being, and it would have really ruined everyone's day. Him, everyone else involved, his families. But like you get him home. Since semiotics says is actually semiotics. Word you're looking for? No, I, I knew it was coming. Huzzah! Um, yeah, all maps are intricate signs. Sure. Well, then again, lots of things are intricate signs. Unreal says, have you ever seen the fuel dogs that ride the subways in Moscow? Seem like they have a better sense of things than that. No, I don't. I have not been to Moscow, but like, and I have not heard about that, but I'm not surprised. Um, what's really funny is you sometimes see pigeons taking the subway in New York and it's confusing. Do they actually understand what they're doing? They might. I don't know. Do they understand they're getting a free ride down like a few blocks? Because you will see birds hop on the fucking subway take it, ride it, and then hop off the subway. And I'm not 100% convinced that they don't understand. Like, they might really understand. Birds aren't real? Fair. Um, yeah, just the stories? Interesting, yeah. Well, the pigeons and stuff like that, like, I've... It, it happens. And I'm not entirely certain what's going on with the pigeons sometimes. 
Okay, so... Yeah, this would be the most salient aspect of Wittgenstein's critique of the philosophy of language. While the received view and his own earlier view uh, begin monolingually from the vantage point of literacy, fluency, or mastery, quote, new boroughs with straight and regular streets and uniform houses, end quote, one must begin from illiteracy instead, that is, without a map that tells us how the relation of signs on the map provides a picture of reality. Adam says, I saw the meme where a New York pigeon push a a pigeon into an oncoming train. Yeah, I'm not surprised. They're they're brutal animals sometimes. I'm mad they're just constantly fair jumping. I'm not mad about that. Um, it's re- it's getting expensive, and I know why people like it's like if you're not got a job, you should. I'm not surprised that people fair jump. It's getting a little bit of a cultural thing. The younger generations just don't give a shit, and that's kind of a problem because it. And you kind of got to pay for like the stuff in the city. You have to realize like this is all like this sort of stuff is like every non-rich person's like this is how we live. So it is a bit of a problem. But um, yeah, like it's complicated. I'm not mad they're fair jumping. I'm kind of mad at the system that got us to this place. But yeah, people just will go onto the bus like they won't pay for buses. And I'm kind of of the mind that buses should just be free at this point. Yeah. Well, they're going to, they may auction off Trump Tower very soon, and then he's going to have to pay tax on the sale. So that may be the most tax he's ever paid in his life, where he, if like Letitia James gets her way, and I hope she does, where he gets max penalties for all the bullshit he pulled, um, then he's going to have to sell all of his shit in New York. He's going to, he's not going to be allowed to do any business and he's have to going to pay, um, income on top of all of the, uh, stuff he's been forced to sell. And that'll be a huge amount of money and it'll come into, it'll go into the New York state's, uh, coffers. So that'll be good. Viper says since 2020, all forms of public transport in Luxembourg, including buses, trains, and trams are free to use. We need to do that in New York. They were doing some bus routes for free. But we need, I, I think we should just have like all bus routes be free at this point because so many people have been uh, just running onto the buses and ignoring uh, the fares that it, um, it's getting to be like, just n- not bother. <clears throat> yeah, see, that's the question. He can't pay if he's broke. He'll have to borrow some rubles. No, this is going to be taxed the sale of all of his buildings. Now, people are going to start coming after him, like the banks to get some of the, the cut of those sales. We'll have to see. And the real question is who's going to buy it? Is someone going to try and uh, curry favor with him and by massively overbidding for all of his uh, stuff? So like it's like some, you know, obscure billionaire going to give him like four times the uh, the price that anyone else would give for some of his stuff. Peter Thiel, maybe. Adam says, rarely do the rich pay. They always scheme their way out. Yeah, well, that's part of contemporary society is that you can buy your way out of your problems. But it's been that way for a long time, too. I mean, you could always... That's how universities got started. A lot of them were prayer circles that rich people paid so that the priests would pray away their sins. They'd pay someone else to pray for your sins so that you didn't have to pray and you could continue sinning. And so rich people would pay... uh, the priests and religious folk and to have a little institute and they'd give them money and they'd pray away their sins and that's how universities got started fun fact about the history of universities um yeah so what happened it's been going on a long time unreal says at the beginning of covid the detroit buses went free so they didn't have to deal with fares but they went back to charging yeah some of our buses were free during the uh covid and now only certain routes are free and uh yeah I don't see why Elon Musk would give anything to Trump. Um, That doesn't seem like he would be the one. It would be some, like, you know, foreign national trying to curry favor. You know, some country that wants, like, would hope that if he gets back in power, would give, like, you know, look the other way when they do something heinous or something like that. Uh, Sensei Max says, I thought university started by the fact that there was one textbook for everyone in the whole class to share. Uh, No, that's not how universities got started. (laughs) But be interesting. Okay. <coughs> I read that in The Rise of the University. Ah, uh, okay. One textbook. The idea of such picturing held us captive, writes the philosopher. Quote, it lay in our language and language seemed to repeat it to us inexorably. So even when philosophers write about language, they do so supposing that speaking and writing are always about something and they represent thoughts by expressing them or situations by depicting them. This position of aboutness is one of critical distance, knowledge and power, fluency and mastery. 
held captive in this position, philosophers of language could do nothing but reaffirm it. This is like a historical sociological fact. Once you get into philosophy of language, everything becomes philosophy of language. It's not the best thing to be doing, but like that happens a lot. Simply by virtue of speaking a language together and sharing in a form of life, we seem to be in, a, in possession of German, French, and Japanese maps, where each tells us how the relation of signs on the map provides a picture of reality. And of course, these various maps can be compared. Yeah, so this is old story, semiotic story, where language reflects the culture and reality of the people. However, in the later work of his philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein has many reasons to doubt that such maps are sufficient to provide orientation and begins anew abandoning his picture theory of language, begins illiterate in the city in the multilingual condition and the built environment with its machines and technical routines. I do not know my way about. So this is incorrect. He never uh, gets rid of the picture theory of language. You just don't know how to apply it anymore. So you're speaking language, but you're not always this is why you get uh, lines. You're speaking languages, but you're multilingual. So you're speaking different languages and you have to find some way to orient them. So you don't actually abandon the picture theory. Sorry, I'm jumping on a technical point there. You're abandoning a universal picture theory. That's all. Viper says, it's not that Elon would try to curry favor with Trump. It's that they both have their noses up Putin's ass. Yes. Um, the JPEG theory of language. Yes, that's kind of it. It's like everything's gotten blurry. It's not that it's not a picture anymore. It's just that you don't know how to apply it. Um, like you, you under like at any given point, you might know what the, your town looks at, like, or the city you're in looks like. You might have a map. You just don't know where you are on the map. Is the problem? It's like you can easily get a map. You just don't know where, how to actually orient yourself on the map. That's the thing. It's like where you need the you are here thing. And that's one of the g brilliant things about GPS. It's that like you always have a you are here. Maybe something more to like yeah why that is weird you don't actually know the place you know you only know the abstract where you are but still oh my god what if the picture is fractal then you have fallen off the side of reality adam fighter <laughs> yeah you get yourself into a fractal city and you just keep going into the same house like over and over and over that'd be a little bit of a problem okay most cities bear the imprint of urban planning. They adopt an international system of signage and every effort is made to render them usable with intuitive interfaces, designed affordances, paving the way. Enhance, enhance, enhance. Exactly, Adam Fighter. Should always have like, I should have an enhance button, but I don't. Just enhance. And yet, if only heuristically, it makes sense to begin from the position of illiteracy that is with the challenge of making sense and rendering the city readable by any means necessary. Again, if you're illiterate, you're not just going to make sense of anything at all. This is what I'm saying. The metaphor here is a little bit messed up. You are speaking a different language. You're going to have to find a translation to what you do understand. No, all right. Author continues. No matter how well equipped, the strangers who enter the city find themselves in the middle of things. Uh, middle of things. They lack what Wittgenstein was seeking and what maps provide, promise to provide. A synoptic view, a place from which to survey the situation. At best, with a printed or digital map in hand, a stranger might try, with considerable effort, to relate the synoptic view of the map to the experience on the ground. Yeah, so you can think. You have your map here, and then you start like, well, that over there is this thing here, and that over there is this thing here. And so you're here, and you can see those things off in the distance. But, like, that's the thing. You have to, like, sort of, uh, you know, it's not always the easiest thing to orient yourself. You have to know the sort of thing you're looking at. See that it's like, you have to say that building with that, like, you know, tower over there and that like thing with like the water on it or whatever. It's like still not easy to orient yourself. All right. The strangers cannot survey from above, nor can they look straight ahead and claim a horizon of action in which they confidently forge a path. St typically strangers look down or down or decipher close up, down to the ground like uh, Hansel and Gretel, who seek to retrace their steps and and down at their smartphones to which they entrust themselves as they are located and nudged along so many meters straight ahead, then a then a right, finally a left. By this method, they reach their destination. Yeah, there were some tourists where I was um, the other day, and one of them had forgotten to charge their phone, and they were like standing there in the middle of New York City saying, how am I going to get home? And their friends were like, oh, God, how are we going to like get you home like from this location? And because their phone was out, they only had relied on the GPS. They don't have a map anymore. So, yeah. <coughs> so it's interesting. Like they had this. They lost all their things. They knew exactly where they were. I'm not in a weird place in New York City, but like 
they couldn't get home from that place because they couldn't find even a road to get out without their phone. And the, uh, the people they were talking to was like, oh, but do you have like a cord somewhere? And they're like, yeah, I have a cord. They're like, okay, we'll charge your phone somewhere and then we'll, so you can at least get yourself on a main road. Like, yeah. Like, all right. By reading signs close up, mediated by devices and experiences, one can build a sense of familiarity through habituation, participation, and repetition. Illiterates thus learn to orient themselves quite successfully without understanding urban design principles, the master plan, or the layout of the city. Yeah, this is this is slightly annoying me. It's not they're pushing the metaphor here of illiteracy when clearly they have to be able to like already orient themselves. It's just they're speaking a different language and they're translating. But it's like, yeah, of course you don't need urban design principles, but you do need to understand like how roads go into highways and then the highways can lead you out. So yeah. So it's like that you do have to understand. Viper says, as far as practical applications of this paper go, makes me think of this Wikipedia long-term nuclear waste warnings messages. Yeah, those are cool. How do you communicate warnings to people that may not speak your language or share your culture, like maybe thousands of years in the future, and they stumble upon like nuclear waste? How do you do that? And that's a good point. Like, how do you actually communicate things to people you don't know what they're thinking? And like how like how fundamental of a sign or symbol can you make it so that someone from a very different uh, place from you, a very different culture might understand. So, yeah, but that's the thing. You have like these big red signs like warning and stuff like that. And that generally works around with, you know, people in the U.S. I don't know if that has the same meaning as, you know, someone from a very far away place. Fuck him is most people's attitude. Well, that's kind of the point I was making about the dude on the train. If we just, if I just said, fuck that guy, and he somehow got stuck on the train and didn't know where to get off, because he was on the right train, but he was very disoriented about where to get off, all of a sudden it becomes burdensome to, like, the health and human services. Like, you have to get the guy, like, he might, someone might have called the cops on the guy. He would have had to get, like, EMS there, check him out, had to, like, do all this stuff. And all of a sudden it becomes a drain on the New York services, which are already strained. All it took was, it was like, yo, dude, you get off the stop after me. And that was all. And then that guy's going to get back and he won't have a problem anymore. So it's like, yes, we could do the fuck him attitude. But you know what? I like civilization. I like civilization. I don't want to be at war. I like civilization where I can go and get a fucking, you know, croissant or whatever. So it's like, that's the thing. It's not always so good to be like, fuck him. Adam Fighter. There's a temple, I believe, in India. And there is one room that cannot be opened. So they put a lot of cobras on it. <laughs> yeah. Cobra reliefs, yeah, sculptures. See, interesting. So again, how do you do this? Cobra relief sculptures. That's fascinating that they were like, cobras are scary and we hope that people know this. Well, that's like a magnet to Harrison Ford, what I say. <laughs> yeah, dangerous. Oh, he's going to go open that up, yes. Um, since Max is funny you mentioned the train earlier, you said the trolley problem, yeah, fuck that guy. Well, if we're running over people, not people on the train, we're running over the people, fuck that guy. Ivan Neal says, yeah, I'm open to that one first. Yeah, Adam Fighter, yeah. <laughs> Andre Bryan says, just learned something about a favorite science fiction author. Quote, Polish science fiction author Stanislaw Lem proposed the creation of artificial satellites that would transmit information from their orbit to, uh, from orbit to Earth for millennia. He also described a biological coding of DNA in a mathematical sense, which would reproduce itself automatically. Information plants would only grow near terminal storage sites and would inform humans about the danger. The DNA of the so-called atomic flowers could contain the necessary data about both the location and its uh, content. Yeah. So also, DNA has an error replication rate. The error replication rate for DNA replication it's different for different species, but we can track that and we can actually see things in history using error replication uh, rates. So there's certain time periods in he history where the DNA replication rate is more accurate than carbon dating, d dating for things that are like, I think, 50,000 years. So you can actually see more accurate when like something fucked with our DNA, like there was a, a volcano went off spewing toxic things into the air, fucking with our DNA, we can see where that is in history more accurately using the DNA replication than otherwise. So you could definitely do that. That is a thing that has been considered and is definitely done. Hey, it all costs money. What's up? We all have about 80 years on this life. Why not try to make it a bit better for everyone? Yeah, well, that's the also the problem. People like, I got mine. I want to have the better life. And so then you step on someone else to get that better life. Guy loves cobras. Exactly. We got a little hype there. Adam says, you saved that guy's life? Maybe. 
They called social services on him. They would have taken his right to live independently, locked him up in life where they might, where they neglect him and take his retirement checks. Entirely possible. You know, the guy had family. It wasn't like he was in that bad of a situation, but like it was just a little bit of like, you get older, you get disoriented. Maybe he was a little dehydrated. All that sort of stuff can add up, but like, you don't know what's going to happen. The problem is the uncertainty at that point. It's just, it's not worth it. Like my grandma, people helped her out in the city. So I appreciate this. It's like, sometimes she just needed, you know, you need like a glass of water. You need someone to call someone for you. It happened. It's like, and that helped her out. And she lived on her own. So she was 90 and then she got sick and died at 91, but she was living on her own in 90 in Manhattan. Like, yeah, you can do it. So I, like when she needed food, me and my cousin, we would call the uh, food delivery services and then she'd get groceries delivered to her door. She couldn't carry them anymore. But so what? We have like grocery delivery services nowadays. Fine. And so all the services in the city, just a little bit of help. She was fine to live on her own for a long time. Since I was right. But fuck that guy was what we were saying about our nuclear waste as it affects descents of thousands of years hence. Well, that too. Yeah, that's the fuck the guy. That's true. <laughs> um... If you don't have kids, does your DNA have an NDA? Yes, exactly. No step on steak. No step on steak. Uh, Sensei Max says, I'm not saying that's the way it should be, just that we really don't care about people that may never exist. Yeah, and it's funny. Um, in decision theory uh, discussions, they actually talk about this a lot. How do you actually decide for people that don't exist because they don't have a moral standing? You're only hypothetical moral standing. And so how do you actually do that if you're talking about like, the decisions for people that don't exist because they don't have moral standing. And so there's no point in actually reasoning for them. Yeah. Except Jesus. Yeah. Andrew O'Brien says, a uh, French author, Francois Bastide and the Italian semiotician Paolo Fabri proposed the breeding of so-called radiation cats or ray cats, cats have a long history of cohabitation with humans. And this approach assumes that their domestication will continue indefinitely. These radiation cats would change significantly in color when they came near radioactive emissions and serve as living indicators of danger. Yeah. So we'd have, uh, they'd be canaries in the coal mine. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. Imagine if a cobra became the symbol for free candy. Could happen, you know, and there's definitely probably cultures that have great respect for cobras and would want to go near them. Yeah. So this is the thing. <laughs> yes. Red hot pussy inside. Good kitty. Very good kitty. Um. Okay. Where were we? <sighs> yeah. So basically you don't have to know. You have to know something about cities. You have to be human. That way we can have this sort of discussion. What would scare a human? What, how would you be oriented? That's the sort of thing. <laughs> oh, great. Now we've got cats that started lighting up. Yeah. So we candy in quotes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Similarly, if the philosophy of language is concerned with questions of representation and how the world becomes intelligible to the speaker of a language, the philosophy of multilingualism does not privilege the potent speaker, but foregrounds the Ill illiterate who gain orientation through coordination. Even pluriling plurilingual individuals who speak three or more languages will find themselves in the position of illiteracy in a multilingual condition, which is characterized by the confluence of not only of many natural languages, pig pigins, dialects, but also by the formal codes, signage, beeping sounds, emojis, professional jargon, sequences of keys that need to be entered to purchase a subway ticket, etc. Yeah, because like even if you speak four languages, if you don't speak Chinese and then you go to China, you're going to have a bad time. So like this is the thing. It doesn't matter how many languages you speak, but you may have a better op, uh, better chance at orienting yourself once you know more about the human condition. So maybe you don't speak Chinese, but maybe you speak something is it sim like maybe Japanese. They're not the same, of course, but maybe they have some cultural overlap and maybe you could orient yourself better in knowing Japanese in a Chinese environment. Unlikely, but it might happen. But like, that's the thing. Once you know something about maybe a nearby culture, you could still get by better than someone who had no, uh, nothing of, knows nothing of those cultures. Okay. This consideration of the multilingual condition highlights the peculiar form of int intelligence that is required to navigate the world by way of coordination rather than representation. This is the intelligence of the person who cannot read or write and still manages to blend in to compensate and cover up what is commonly regarded as a humiliating form of ignorance. See, this is unfair. Like being in a place you don't understand is not necessarily humiliating. You could be a tourist. That's not humiliating. But I mean, if you get lost in your own town, that might be humiliating. But again, that doesn't happen. Why would that happen? Well, maybe you're disoriented because, you know, you gotten old and you're dehydrated. But again, 
that's something else. I wouldn't call that humiliating. That's, you know, you've uh, got some deficiencies. You got water, you're dehydrated. That's not embarrassing. Okay. In quite another sphere, this form of ignorance and its compensation is generally accepted as normal. We can pretend to be computer savvy without understanding anything at all about how computers work, merely by virtue of being habituated to input-output patterns in normal use and occasional breakdowns, that is, by coordination and participation in the working order of things. So this is like those people on TV that are faking being hackers. You can fake it, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Vipers, unless you're looking for the clitoris and then you, you're just shit out of luck. You have to coordinate better. <laughs> to be sure, there is engineering science and engineers... There is engineering science and engineers acquire representational knowledge of what the world is like, including theories and laws of nature. Yeah, so maybe you could have an argument that ChatGPT has a grand map of uh, English at this point. So yeah, you're into the mainframe, exactly. Enhance, enhance, enhance. Yeah, it's like, I'm a... I know this. This is Linux. I know this. Uh, this is a Unix system. I know this. Exactly. <laughs> Go back to uh, Jurassic Park. God, I love that movie. Speaking of DNA computers and like faking you know shit. Okay. And yet, what engineers and users, the fine and the mechanical arts, have in common is a kind of cohabitation with the things, a feeling for the organism, um, the mechanism, the algorithm. See, right here, you can see they're getting wishy-washy. What do you have? You have a feeling for. What the fuck is that? Come on, man. In virtue of participating haptically and mentally in different working orders, we learn something about the interplay of things and the effects that can be produced by configuring or co composing things in this or that way. Here, participation conditions attunement to the world of things and our, and our ways of learning how things can work together. Okay, so now they're saying coordination is more important than having the overarching view. Can you work together with the world you're in without actually understanding the big picture? Maybe. No feeling zone. Yeah, but this is right here. This is getting hand wavy as far as I'm um, concerned uh, in terms of the philosophy. They're trying to do something hard. I grant them that. They're trying to explain something complicated here. What is coordination when you don't have an overarching view? But a feeling for it is not explaining anything. That's just saying you can do it. So it's, uh, yeah. The organism doesn't care about your feelings. Yeah, I don't think women care about your feelings either. If you're looking for the clitoris like vipers, can't find it. So that's the thing. Ivan says a digital frontier. I tried to picture a cluster of information as they moved through the computer. What did they look like? Ships, motorcycles, were the circuits like freeways? I kept dreaming of a world I thought I'd never see. And then one day I got in. I am looking forward to grading this one. Yeah. So this is interesting. This has got, this is saying a lot of stuff, but like, yeah. So like, but like different people are, I think are going to feel differently about this one. Philosophical jazz hands. Yes. Hand waving. Exactly. So how do you describe coordination without having any, you know, imp like any understanding of what's going on? You can't do that. And that's why I kept highlighting that this person kept saying uh, illiteracy. It, this can't, you can't be completely illiterate. You have to be able to feel your way through, but that's because you do have some sort of understanding physical or otherwise um, of what's going on here. And so that's a little weak on this author's thing, but I, I appreciate that they're even trying to describe what it is to be in a state of confusion because that's a hard topic like how do you explain what it is to be confused like that's the whole point is you can't talk about it okay participating in the world of things of symbols of and codes this is the core of urban experience and of living in the city it signifies the immediate connection between urban experience the multilingual condition and our technologically constructed environment. Participants are initially illiterate and from this position acquire orientation and the capacity to read or anticipate through habituation, repetition, and or socialization. You know, I've had friends come into the city that have never been to like a big city before. Not that they're from like Bumblefuck, but they've never been to like, they haven't been to Paris. They haven't been to London. They've been to like their local cities and they get to New York and they get wide eyed. They're like, oh my God, look at these buildings. It's like, yeah, you've seen pictures of them, but it's different to be there. And that's a good point here. When you get like what this person saying is like you get into the city, all of a sudden the sort of orientation you have to all these different like you know roads and like signs and all that stuff it's a little different so it's fair 
Like, this is part of the thing is that when you actually get here and if you haven't been to Chicago, if you haven't been to New York, if you haven't been to Paris or London or one of these other giant cities, it's like it's not you're not going to be have the experience. Your rural Michigan parents kind of freaked out about the Chicago loop. Yes. And so this is the sort of experience. The, this is, again, another weakness of this paper right here. They could have. They, this is not a crazy example. They could have said something like this here, where you've got someone that, not stupid, just not, but just has not experienced a very big city before, and now all of a sudden has got themselves in like smack dab in Manhattan, and they're like, holy fuck, what the fuck is going on? Or like, I don't know what the Chicago Loop is, but clearly, like, you could do that. Like, you get yourself to Boston, and you're like, you, uh, they did a big dig, they put all the roads underground, and then all of a sudden you come out, and like, you're in like the middle of the city. It's like, imagine like you were from like, not a big area and then all of a sudden you're just like you're in a tunnel and then boom giant buildings all around and like traffic is like madness and drunk people <laughs> running the streets so it's like yes you're in boston welcome <coughs> so attunement through participation Wittgenstein's comparison of language and a city leads us, led us from one idea to quite another of how to orient oneself in the city, in the technosphere, in language. From literate concepts, categories, and propositions, or plans, maps, and designs that are somehow in our possession, we shifted initially to initially illiterate participation that affords knowledge as one learns to navigate and to discern how things work. The move from veridical representation to reliable coordination comes with an epistemic challenge. Can philosophy of the city or a philosophy of multilingualism retrace and reconstruct the attainment of knowledge <coughs> strictly on the surface of things that is without relying on depth, without referring to underlying structures or meaningful intentions? Quote, in the use of words, one might distinguish surface grammar from depth grammar. What immediately impresses upon us... <coughs> yeah. Losing it. What immediately impresses itself upon us about the use of a word is the way it is used in the sentence structure. The part of its use, one might say, that can be taken in by the ear. And now compare the depth grammar, say of the verb, to mean, with what its surface grammar would lead us to presume. No wonder one finds it difficult to know one's way about. All right, again, I, I'm annoyed with this person's uh, use of, like, see, you can't get away from the meaning of the word to mean. You know both its use in language and, like, the depth of what it goes. Philosophy has finally vanquished it. Well, talking has vanquished me. I'm not surprised about that. But it's like, this is the thing. No one's illiterate here. There is no one that doesn't understand the word. But like, you might not know the word in context in this case. And that's the problem. This person's trying to explain how we learn things from nothing. And that's not true. That's why we have surface grammar and depth grammar in this example right here. Because you can't, you actually have two different things. You have the use of a word, and then you have the what you really understand a term to mean, like uh, some deeper understanding of it. So there's two things that you're trying to coordinate here. You're trying to match up how it gets used in this one case with your further understanding of it. That's what the the real trouble is here. How do you orient yourself in a new situation when you aren't sure exactly how things line up? But you can't be illiterate to begin with. And so this is why this person is trying to make too big of a, a too big of a philosophical gap to jump here. Didn't need to do that. Okay. Author says, there are interestingly different ways of working with this remark. I here read it as a rejection of depth grammar, which considers the use of a verb like to mean with respect to a literally obscure picture of mental acts that occasion utterances or else to the structure function of concepts that serve as a condition of possibility either way, hidden from view and detached from what is taken in by the ear. One will never gain a synoptic view of the lay of the land by following the words into a lexical depth where they are rooted in intentions or meanings. We miss what immediately impresses itself upon us if we insist on tracing an utterance or, or string of signs to a reference thing or a picture, a pictured state of affairs. Yeah, so here's what it's saying. You only have the surface things. You only know how things are used because what else would you have? There is no deep meaning there. This is like just rejecting the idea that we understand what we're talking about. We just know what we're doing in the moment. <clears throat> if orientation requires a synoptic presentation of surface topography, this overview must not require a, ver a vertical ordering of a above and below. Uh, yeah. How long was that first sentence? Yeah. Um, well, the first sentence ends right here. 
The second sentence, on the other hand, goes from here to here, and then the third sentence goes from here to here. Okay, it's not that bad. It's just the words in these sentences, they're packing way too much into them. So it's like, one will never gain a synoptic view of the lay of the land by following words into a lexical graph, where they are rooted in intentions or meanings. Oh, they even fucked up. There's a period and a comma here. Someone must have yelled at them. I didn't see this. There's a period and a comma at that spot. Comma, we miss what immediately impresses itself upon us if we insist on tracing an utterance or string of signs. So like they should have had another sentence there and they missed it. So yeah. So, the root cause. <coughs> this is how it goes. I mean, we can talk about this at the end. Uh, criticisms, what's good and what's bad. Okay, let's get through it. It shouldn't be that much longer. If orientation requires a synoptic presentation, like an overarching view of surface topography, this overview must not require a, ver a vertical ordering of above and below. If I want to find the center of building, I guess, I will succeed neither by climbing up the Eiffel Tower nor by digging down and understanding a mental map and meaning and former a location of Lehal. Um... Knowing how to find it is to know that one takes the RER train to the uh, station Chatelet Leal or the metro to uh, Rambuteau, but only if one finds signs to the correct exit, for otherwise one might still wander about lost. And beware that the center building uh, might go by the name Center Pompidou. <laughs> you get art as dessert? Yes, I know. But I mean, where are we? We are here, and I just got to get to here. This is it. Last page. So here again is the epistemic or programmatic challenge for the, a philosophy of city. If orientation does not require a view from above, how do we build up a synoptic view through participation, that is, through living and moving in a city, our eyes and ears immediately impressed, gaining piecemeal glimpses from multiple vantage points? One way of pursuing this challenge is to take up Walter Benjamin's interest in a cinematically dispersed or distributed mode of beholding, a form of scrutinizing the world cursorily, critically but without set criteria, dispassionately but with an ever better developed sense of what fits or does not fit, what, do what works and what does not work, what is jarring and what goes unnoticed. See, this is interesting. This is saying you have to build up landmarks for yourself. You have to say what is going to catch your own eye. This makes some sense. You go someplace, you find your hotel, you have to remind yourself where your hotel is, where you, how you remind yourself where your hotel is, where you're staying, your friend's apartment, whatever it is, you have to sort of pick mental landmarks that might not matter to anyone else, but they matter to you. And then once you start to understand other things, then you can start to put uh, the rest of the map together. But you can see like, this is not a terrible idea here. This is why this this is a, you know, a little bit of an uneven paper. I think they're screwing up some things, but this person has a point. You don't, you can't just go in and have a, a mental, like, representation of the city, but you can go figure out landmarks that matter to you. Terrible, Ivan says. Terrible. Have you never been lost, Ivan? Have you never gotten yourself lost in a place and had to find your way out? Have you never considered what that takes? Ah. Uh. Historically and phenomenologically, cinematic gaze and urban experience belong together, condition e belong together, condition each other. But are we to assume that the scattered movement of light on the one hand, the distracted, the distracted glance of the beholder on the other hand, give rise to casual judgments of right and wrong, sedimenting finally as knowledge of coordinate coordinations in a working order of people and things? Terrible because it is trivial. Okay, that's fair. If you think this is easy, then you may just be ahead of this person in philosophy. This would imply that a synoptic view arises gradually as one ascends to a, a partial perspective here and there, achieved by a way of habit formation. And this is what I was saying. You get a partial perspective of the area you know. Moreover, are we to assume that this form of knowledge production can be accounted for in a non-mentalistic fashion without reference to beliefs, meanings, representations, or intentions? This programmatic paper suggests as much, fully realizing that work only begins here. What does mere participation and what does living in the city afford epistemically? And how does the comparison of city and language work if one does not derive an urban grammar of things from the monolingual paradigm but takes languages as it impresses eyes and ears in the multilingual condition? Yeah. Conclusion. And so to a series of literary vignettes that characterize the multilingual condition, this Wittgensteinian story can now be added. Quote, 
Getting to know the city by subway is a bit like a mole sticking out its head here and there, leaving this or that subway station and finding one's destination from there, slowly piecing together the layout of the city, discovering only after a while that two apparently different streets are actually the same, sometimes walked in this direction and sometimes from the opposite end. Walking past a playground, a football stadium, a better, a bedding parlor, toddlers frolicking in a water fountain, chess players by the roadside, teenagers in cosplay outfits, a pub with slot machines, we wouldn't learn what a game is were it not for occasional shouts of let's play, stop playing, and the many different uses of game in our native tongue. But then in our housing development, we sit in the courtyard by an improv improvised soccer field and soon learn that tour is another word for goal, and the, the word foul is shared by all the players, that the curse of the curses and insults all sound different, but are clearly just that, curses and insults. Next time our computer freezes up, we will use some of these expressions before we unplug and reboot it, because this is the only language the computer seems to understand. End quote. All these lessons are lessons in attunement to the city, to a multilingual world, to a socio-technical symptoms. Viper says this from 2023. Yeah, I agree with Ivan. Video game map designers have known this since the early 90s. Uh, Fair. Yeah, see, this may be a case where, um, let's get the review going then, because the people obviously have opinions. Um, check out the review. Everyone in chat is welcome to review now. You write the ones all the way on the left side, no, all the way on the right side of your screen, not the ones on the left. Those are like my titles. The, the names on the far left are what you actually have to write. Um, so yeah, and we drink. Okay, so again, th I think there's a few things here. You have to remember, not everyone are Twitch people. The people in our chat, um, <laughs> Vipers, did you write the whole thing? Oh, no. Yeah. Did you write the whole thing down or something? Whatever. Or did you do the emotes command? And just so you know, if you copy that string exactly, it will ignore it because I assumed no one would ever. Oh, you mapped it to a button. Oh, there you go. Because I've mapped it to a button too. Just like this. Um, but yeah, if you actually write that whole string down, um, it will ignore it because it assumed I put it in like this, uh, with my mapped button. That's kind of funny though. Um, not everyone is the Twitch savvy like you people are. You know more about computers and internet. Remember, this is not necessarily directed at you. This is directed at the general public who will not have understood as much about game design as the people here. Ivan Neal says, nay, I think this paper is unmitigated garbage and a fine example of continental crap. It does not clarify Wittgenstein, as I point out. Yes, it fucked up the Wittgenstein. To do what the author really wants, they would need to actually talk about detailed mechanism of cognition. Um, no, I don't think, I don't go with the last conclusion there. They're trying to get the right phenomena down that then we can talk about cognition. What is the right phenomenon? It's not the mapping of like a formal map onto the world. It's the mapping of when you get yourself into a spot, how do you orient yourself in that spot? Looking at a GPS does not actually help you. That tells you where you are on like the, like, you know, the global map that does not tell you how you are going to re recognize where you are at that time in terms of like the buildings around you. So yeah. Ivan Neal says also poop. Instead, this paper invites people to, who talk about stories of the city to, and pretend they are talking about philosophy of language. It's a Rorschach inkblot time. Yeah, so again, I think you're missing the phenomenon because you're assuming that it's easy to orient yourself. I don't think it's easy to orient yourself and it's especially not such an easy thing to say about talk about what happens when you're lost and how you try to get a grasp on the world at that point. So they're trying to hone in on a certain phenomenon. And I, I think that's worth something at least. So yeah, since semiotics, yes, you think they failed. They You liked it, had some fun ideas, but then you also thought a lot of it was crap. Vipers just thought a lot of it was uh, navel gazing, failed to deliver. But since semiotics thought it was argued well. Unreal Brian says basically it raises some interesting questions and ideas, but kind of blathers and doesn't do anything useful with them. So it's a fun idea, but it's a nay and it's golden turd because it looks shiny but um it's poop underneath see the problem with me is i have a soft spot for wittgenstein i have a soft spot for philosophy of the city so I, this, is, this is hitting a lot of my soft spots and so it's uh, <laughs> i want to be like i kind of like it it's i think it's not so easy to talk about a lot of these things yeah they fucked up their picture language which was right here i, I guess you can't see underneath that but um 
they fucked up a lot of stuff in my opinion, but you know, they tried hard. They made a good enough point, but yeah. Yeah. See, that's kind of where I'm with MDD. I think this is really like, as far as outlining something of an interesting experience in a city, like how do you orient yourself like geographically in a city? You're not using the same things you're doing in other places. And it's like, okay, now is this special? Like if you get yourself out into the middle of the woods, how do you orient yourself? I don't know. Started with a good analogy, did not go into depth. So yeah, so everyone's given this a, a little bit of fun and hate. Interesting. Um, Viper says, I also don't accept the normal people don't understand video games argument when the industry is bigger than movie and music industries combined. No, they don't in, uh, understand video game development. They understand video games. They don't understand video game development. I think that's still kind of niche. Um, video game development not that it's like asking someone do they understand movies you say yes do you understand um directing movies i might say not really like no so that's what i mean i don't uh th that sort of thing um how does the city analogy help me understand how to deal with confusions about language and is the analogy clearer than a plain cognitive description no we're not talking about language we're talking about understanding cities using language it's the other way around ivan we're trying to figure out how do you orient yourself in the city and the way you do it is you start to understand the infrastructure and uh, things in that place which are unique to cities. That's kind of the point. And so they're saying like unique features of cities are then going to be analyzed like unique features of language like grammar or syntax or something like roads and stuff are treated like grammar and how like, you know, things the features you might see like subway stations that's treated like the you know, structure of the uh, language. Okay. Yeah, it's merging awkwardly and critically with cinema. It's fair. Like, this person bit off more than they can chew. And basically, so they're going to, for me, they're getting some nod grapes because that's, th this is really the thing. They claimed more than they could do. It did have some fun ideas. So we're going to do brain dance on this also for me. Um, but I'm going to say vote yes. I like it. Well, I guess, like I said, this you're going to get a vote yay out of me because I like this shit. But yeah, it's going to get a lot of the uh, negatives. Um, all style, no substance, still poop underneath. Eh. We're going to give it no. So this is how this is how I'm going. We're giving you two grapes because it failed to really deliver. And it fucked up uh, some of the Wittgenstein, which is, you know, I'm a stickler for this because I know more Wittgenstein than I think uh, most. But I may be wrong. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's my rating there even though i gave it a vote yay it had some serious problems that's okay i think it gets by um if you're interested in city stuff this is an interesting article in my opinion about how to orient yourself in a place you don't, in a city you don't know thank you for gifting another uh sub send semiotics again with my crappy um 